Welcome back to Harbour Unboxed. It's Q&A time. Uh, it's been a while. We missed uh, the first one of the year, the January one, which was a bit sad. Tim was devastated. I was. Tell them how devastated you were. I was very devastated. Yes, very good. So we thought we would do an early February Q&A series. There may be one coming up later in the month as well. We'll see how we go. But anyway, it's sort of a delayed January. The, the people get it. We, we, we've, we've got a Q&A. We're going to do it. So thanks for all the questions. And we're going to give you some answers. But before we do, today's sponsor spot is brought to you by Thermal Grizzly and their Cryo Sheet Graphene Thermal Pads, which are an excellent alternative to thermal pastes. They offer very high thermal conductivity with no liquid components, so they can't dry out and therefore don't degrade over time like pastes and even liquid metals. Cryo Sheet is very easy to use, it's extremely durable, and is available in a range of sizes to suit most applications. I've personally done some high-end GPU testing with Cryo Sheet, and the results were impressive, very similar in fact to that of liquid metal, but without the mess, and of course, no risk of drying out. So for more information, please check the link in the video description. Which do you think is more overpriced? The RTX 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte, or Ryzen 7 8700G. They both use a 180 square millimeter chip. So I guess that's their justification for asking what, which one is worse value. Do they use the same process node? I think it's similar, isn't it? Uh, I'm, I'm more trying to wrap my head around. I don't even know how to answer this question. Uh, yeah, I don't know how to answer this question. They're two very different things. So like they do, they almost do two very different things as well. So which one's more overpriced? Uh, well, I mean, probably, it, it, okay. Let's come at it from their, their perspective lineups. Yeah. Because I think that's the only way to do it, right? Yeah. And that would mean realistically, probably the RTX 4060 a TI 8 gigabyte, because well, that was $400 yes. US, is it? That's been dropped, has it? I think or? it's slightly cheaper now. Okay. Um, Let, let's go with the MSRP. So I would say that's probably more overpriced, just mm. relative to the fact, well, 3060 Ti was like the same performance in a lot of games or faster in some games. It was a pretty garbage product, whereas the 8700G, while niche, I don't know it's technically impressive for it's It's a really hard comparison to make. I guess like in a previous question, we were saying that the APU, the 8700G would have to be about half price. Whereas I think if you halve the price of a 4060 Ti, that would be a really, really good product. Probably close to where it should have been. <laughs> well, it's closer to where it should have been. But like, I think if they, uh, but that, if yeah. they made it $300, which is well, not halving the price. The, the APU is complicated though, because although I think the resulting performance for gaming needs to be half price, you get a ridiculously yeah, you do. good Zen 4 base CPU for $150. Mm. Uh, because that, that's cheaper than most AM4 parts. Like you're talking about a $20 premium over something like a Ryzen 5 5600. So that's a screaming yeah. good CPU for that money. And productivity performance would be really good as well because there's eight cores it, and the that, cash matters less. Less. You're similar to yeah, like that's a, a, good point. a Ryzen 7. So uh, you look, you go back. There's no definitive answer you can give on this that settles it. Uh, but I think, I think just relative... To the other products in the lineup. So, for example, 8700G, it smokes all other desktop APUs mm -hmm. way faster than the 5700. It's, it slays everything for that niche use case. Mm -hmm. So, in that sense, it's a really good value. Like, if you have, if for some reason your PC has to be the size of a CPU box, then the 8700G is a game changer. It allows you to game on a little, like a an ASRock Desk Mini, for example. You yeah, can, you yeah, can that's game true. on that. You can you, you can technically game on that at 1080p using the lowest quality settings or whatever, mm -hmm. whereas other APUs aren't going to allow you to do that in most modern games. The RTX 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte though, is just a massive letdown. It doesn't really... It, it doesn't have a niche use case, does it? It's not like you'd yeah, say... It's crap for hey, everything. For that, that thing, you would use, you'd use that part of that specific thing. You you wouldn't. <laughs> yeah, it, 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 at $400, it was, it was a crap product. Yeah, uh, it needed to be whatever we said it was in the review. Probably closer to three hundred dollars um, would make yeah. sense for that part. Anyway, Hard weird question. question. We've probably spent too much time on it, so we'll move on. All right, Tim, I have a business-related question here for you. So put on okay, your, put, interesting. Put on your business cap. 
Do you think that NVIDIA should split their AI and GeForce brand division uh, like AMD, Radeon, and Ryzen? I guess you first have to ask, like, how split are they to begin with right now? Because not all of the AI products that NVIDIA makes are under the GeForce brand. There's a lot of server hardware. There's that, obviously the add-in cards for workstations, which are not GeForce branded. So... I would imagine that a lot of the AI work is probably being done outside of GeForce, especially mm-hmm. some of their research divisions and teams. Sort of, they're a bit separate. So, yeah, it seems like the AI features are just being added to GeForce generally. So, yeah, I think if they're just splitting the divisions like AMD has with Radeon and Ryzen, it probably wouldn't make too much difference to how the company operates. They're always going to go with the the division that kind of makes them the most money. Sort of how AMD has been focusing more towards their epic server stuff which again isn't really a ryzen part either it's epic it's a different line so mm-hmm. i think if you're talking more like separate companies so they're sort of forced to split them off or spin them off or whatever then maybe you'd see some differences there in terms of how things are run and prioritized within the company because they'd be forced to run them as separate companies again how much difference would that make when they're still owned by some sort of parent holding company or whatever i don't know but yeah, certainly I wouldn't think that just splitting them off, making it like, hey, we've got NVIDIA GeForce that does gaming and then NVIDIA, I don't know, AI, whatever, that does AI. I can't see that solving problems like expensive GPUs, for example. Well, it's not a different product. They're no. selling the same silicon. That's so. right. Like if they, were, if they were contracting a different fab to make the AI products and then the gaming division was contracting, getting their supply from somewhere else so they're not in conflict and they can continue to make parts fully separate from each other, then again, you'd probably see some differences with a different divisions and things like that. But as you say, they're competing for the same silicon. They're competing in some products for things like the same memory, PCB, manufacturing, competing for packaging resources is really big these days. So again, I don't see that having too much of an impact and certainly wouldn't solve the the main... Like I imagine this question is coming up because people want GeForce to be separated so that we can get better value GPUs and things like that. I just, I can't see that happening with a different structure. It's it's going to be up to, yeah, competition, consumers buying products and, yeah, how the AI things go in mm-hmm. the future. How do you feel about the used hardware market? With GPU pricing being what it is, I can't see myself buying new in that particular segment for the foreseeable future, especially when there are always enthusiasts who are selling off their previous gen GPUs and the buyer protections offered by platforms like eBay makes going used a less risky option than it used to be. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean, yeah, it's always been a pretty good value option yep. for various different PC components, but GPUs in particular, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously it has its pitfalls where you can get in trouble, but there are stuff like eBay buyer protection and PayPal and all that sort of stuff as well. Yeah, generally I'm all for it if you can get yourself a good deal. Now, especially if you're someone who's willing to sort of research, uh, make a few bookmarks, pay a bit of attention, bid on a few different things and try and get something at a really good price, then yeah, you can you can get some really good deals. Uh, and, and generally speaking, yeah, the, the products will work and they'll last a long time. And yeah, I mean, I've got GPUs that are so old. <laughs> and I've, got, I've got some that die after a few years. But to, to be fair, when I say some, I think I've had two. And you have a lot of GPUs. I have a lot. Yeah. Uh, and, and some of them are p- pretty poorly looked after and handled and no dramas. They are quite durable, despite the fact that they're a sensitive electronic component. Uh, yeah, I, I've, I've, I've got no problems with it. I really recommend it, especially if you have a healthy used market, secondhand market in your region with something like eBay or you know, whatever to access it. Um, yeah, all for it. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. I- I think looking over the used market in certain segments, you'll you'll find a few oddities at times where two products that are actually pretty similar in performance have very different pricing or the reverse where Mm -hmm. you've got they're very similar in price, but the performance is very different. So yeah, it definitely pays to do your research, especially when you've got NVIDIA like super versus non-super products. Often the, the super products can be a little overpriced. So if you're going back to like your RTX 20 series, for example, it's worth paying attention to those things. But yeah, I mean, it'd be interesting to see data on things like how often do GPUs fail like from the box versus once you know they've been working for a year or so, Mm -hmm. when do they sort of fail? Because I feel like on the used market, most of the products that you see are sold as working and they're sort of, they've 
they've been tested and you know that they work as opposed to that obviously you can buy the four parts ones as well mm -hmm. whereas when you buy from a retailer obviously one of the main reasons you want a warranty is if it's just straight up dead on arrival or there's some issues straight away mm -hmm. um i think once you get something that's working i think with the gp you'd pretty much be expecting it to last for quite a while so yeah i fully agree with things like the used market being a great way to get a good value product and typically pricing is, you know, you're getting a fairly good discount compared to buying new for the same cards. But again, you always have to do your research. If, if you're after a used model of a card that's still being sold new, you always have to watch out for like when the new card drops in price a little bit. Often it can take a couple of months for that to be reflected on the used market in terms of the price coming down. So yeah, those are all sort of the pitfalls with, with used. But yeah, it's a great way to get a, a GPU at a, at a lower cost, and especially right these days where you know things are not exactly attractive. They're making new cards with effectively the same performance as old cards. I'd much rather get like a used 3060 Ti than buying a brand new 4060 Ti 8 gigabyte. That value just mm -hmm. doesn't seem there to me. So yeah, go used. Look at what's available. All right, Tim, do you think AIB partners and retailers are artificially lowering the prices of their existing cards before reviews drop for new cards to try and mislead reviewers who base their reviews off street pricing. So, so I guess this is like AMD, well, it's not even AMD, they're asking AIB partners in retail. So it's sort of like, are Newegg and, say, Sapphire reducing the price of a 7900 XT ahead well, of a... Well, I, I don't believe that's review. how the system works anyway. Yeah, I, did, I thought it was more on the manufacturer providing AMD a, will reach out, yeah. provide... They'll, they will, they will, it's almost like a buyback. They'll, they'll say, sell them for this price and we'll pay the difference on the losses. So drop it by $50, we give you $50 yep. um, that, to move the inventory. So that, that's my understanding of how the system works. Mm -hmm. And yeah, look, AMD have definitely done that. NVIDIA's done that from time to time when there's a new product coming. They try to like steal their thunder. They did it with the 4070. That was dropped from 600 to 550 before the official price cut, which happened at CES. Mm -hmm. It was mm -hmm. the unofficial $550 price. Mm -hmm. And that was like, was it a day after or a day before the 7800 XT reviews? It was around that time, but it was mm -hmm. certainly in response to that. Yeah, um, we're, we're aware of it happening. Uh, I think for the 7900 XT pricing when I was reviewing the... 4070 Ti Super, I think it was. I didn't go with the absolute lowest pricing because I wasn't convinced that that was the real price. That was a very temporary price. So we try to, mm -hmm. yeah, we try to stay ahead of that workout. Yeah, and we and we do that by reaching out to retailers and, and various companies in the industry to say, hey, this price here is this, how is this being subsidized and what, what's the time on this? And sometimes I'll say, yeah, look, it's only subsidized for this particular batch and the price will go back up so mm -hmm. then we, we sort of know what's going on there so we do get some good insight like that sometimes uh but yeah it's just one of those things that you sort of have to keep an eye out for but fire selling products and offering temporary discounts and things i mean that's happened since the dawn of time so it's nothing new that we have to sort of keep an eye out for yeah that's right i think you know Reducing the price and then keeping it that price, there's obviously no issue with that. So if mm -hmm. AMD or NVIDIA wants to cut the price because of a new product that's coming out, even if it's this unofficial price reduction thing, that's great mm -hmm. for buyers. The The tricky thing is obviously the reducing it temporarily to get the good positive coverage and then it going back up. You know, that that's tricky, but I, I don't think that has happened too often or too significantly. Like, for example, the 7900 XT, I think it came down to about seven hundred and fifty dollars around, you know, key reviews and things. Then it went back up slightly, but it didn't go all the way back up to nine hundred dollars. It would have been bad if it was like, "Hey, we're dropping this by one hundred and fifty dollars the week mm -hmm. the original forty seventy Ti is came out." Seven hundred dollars now. I think it's close to seven hundred dollars. So when I reviewed, I think it was the RTX forty seventy Ti Super, worst name ever. When I reviewed that product, they had dropped it to seven ten for like one or two models, with the rest at seven fifty or higher. Mm -hmm. Now, I spoke with AMD privately, and ahead of their sort of press release they did, they said they've enabled partners to hit 750 reliably for that product. It's sort of the new unofficial official MSRP. Yeah. <laughs> so when I saw the 710 price, I thought, you know what, I'm going to go with 750 because I've just heard from the horse's mouth that 750 is kind of the new price. So I expect the 710 price to potentially be a limited yeah. time only deal. But then obviously when these products launched and we saw the price of them and the fact that the 700 XT really needed to be $700 max, uh, it, I think 
it's pretty much worked its way down to that, but I haven't done any updated looks at that stuff yet because we ended up moving into CPU testing and other things and haven't revisited that. And probably yep. this month we'll get a GPU pricing update yes. guide thing because yep. we skipped we'll last month. Um, yeah. Do you think AMD's Radeon division will ever have their Zen moment where they can compete neck and neck with their main competitor? So NVIDIA in this case. <laughs> Honestly, no. Like, no. Yeah. I, based on everything that I've seen in my time reviewing these sort of things, not that I review the GPUs and stuff. But I've been waiting a long business, time. But, you know, we've been doing this for a long time, you about twice as long as me. And in that time, there's always been that the thought that this will happen. This, like at some point they will do something. This generation. Um, but it hasn't happened. So I think if we're just going on trends right, it's probably not going to happen. And again, the reason why AMD was able to have their Ryzen moment is because Intel made some pretty significant blunders with their CPU division, with things like their fabrication process, stalling quite a bit, having issues getting those new nodes out the door, which sort of meant they had to redo the same architecture, repeat the same architecture quite a few times. And funnily enough, they're sort of almost doing that again now to some lesser of a degree, but they're mm -hmm. still doing it at the moment. But mm -hmm. basically that stumble in the Skylake era gave AMD this big opportunity to fix their architecture and improve it while their main competitor wasn't really doing all that much. And that's, that's the Ryzen moment that we mm -hmm. got. Mm -hmm. With NVIDIA, they haven't really stumbled like, I know we can say that there's some poor value products in the 40 series and there hasn't been a lot of improvement in some areas, but the 4090 is still a big leap in performance. The, the 3090 was a big leap in performance. The 2080 Ti was a big leap in performance. So they keep adding performance, they're adding new features, they're innovating on all those fronts that it doesn't give AMD that opportunity to improve while their competitor doesn't. NVIDIA is always improving, whereas Intel didn't for a while. It's, that's definitely true, but at the same time, it ignores the fact that AMD was so aggressive in making Ryzen work. Yes, like they but they was, were a lot further behind. Yeah, I mean, yes and no, like... Even today, they're still fairly aggressive with what they're doing. Like, you know, there's a lot of price cuts. CPUs are dropping mm -hmm. down. They're, they're, I, I, to me, it still feels like even in their more dominant position, let's say, mm -hmm. they're, they're still cutting prices of CPUs. They're still ensuring that they're, they're seeing high volumes of sales with the CPUs. And sure. I don't, they're really pushing them. They're really making an effort to push them out the door. But... Beyond just that as well, there's the things like platform support that they're doing stuff that they... That I guess the point I'm trying to make is they're doing things their competitors not doing. They're not just following in Intel's footsteps. They're like, oh, you lock most of your products down from being overclocked, mm -hmm. so we're just going to offer overclocking on our X processors and mm -hmm. everything else is locked. They haven't done that. Right, so you're sort of saying like, why hasn't Radeon done the open platform? They've been the more equivalent bold. Of an yeah, yeah. Like, like, where's those killer features that the competitor's not doing yeah, to incentivize com people Competitive pricing, over. All, all that. You, you just look at it, it's two different approach. It's basically two different companies in what they've done over the last, what, mm -hmm. seven years with, with Ryzen. There's so many different aspects of Ryzen that you can look at that they're doing either better than their competitor or they're just doing it, period. Um, yeah. And they're, they're, just being, they're being so much more aggressive and Radeon's just like, you know, I guess in some ways, like floundering. a lot of those features that we've been talking about were established quite a while ago, mm -hmm. like things like unlocked CPUs, open platform support, being aggressive on pricing. Those are all carryovers from quite a while ago. They haven't, as they've gotten more dominant, there's been less of those, you know, what's this, what's another feature that you could add to that pile? Whereas I guess you know, benefiting them is the fact that Intel has not competed on those features. So they're, yeah, they're, they're still a selling point for them, right? They've innovated though with stuff like, you know, 3D V cache, which is they have, with, they have. pun intended, like a game changer. So yeah. there's, there's, there's been more things happening there, whereas Radeon's just like, oh, damn, NVIDIA released a new feature. Well, mm -hmm. we'll have an inferior version of that ready for you in 12 to 18 months. Um, Oh, yeah. our GPUs aren't quite as good. I guess we'll knock thirty dollars off, and that should see them sell right well. And then you know, and just even dumb stuff like again, try and explain. It, I can't stress enough. It happened to this generation where they thought it would be okay to release the seventy nine hundred XT, which made no sense in their own product lineup 
for $900 US. Well, they did it twice because they did it with the 7700 XT as well. That was, yeah. that was less egregious. Yeah. But, but still, like, how are they – how is that they're making these mistakes? Mm-hmm. And you think, oh, well, there's some kind of strategy going on there. You know, they're doing this. But then it w- was it even a month where they pretty much openly acknowledged that, yeah, that was a massive stuff up and they, they dropped the price? Pretty much. So it's just – it's – it's weird, but based on everything that I've seen in my time doing this um, and just the current dumb stuff they're doing, like I just mentioned, mm-hmm. um, no. Yeah, I mean, that's right. I think that and we've talked about this when these sort of questions have come up previously is that the things that firstly, if for Radeon to get even close to doing what has been discussed in this question, they have to begin those basics. Right? They're not taking the initial baby steps. Yeah, they need to get the, the fundamental simple things right. Mm-hmm. So not making products have no sense in the product line, mm-hmm. making sure that the pricing is very competitive and that it makes sense to buy, making sure that your products offer a decent amount more generation over generation, things like the RX 7600, questionable whether that was even worth buying. You know, It didn't suffer from the, it made no sense in the lineup, but it's like, but would you buy released, that or a 6600? So, And then they released the 16 gigabyte version, which they could have just done from the start, made it $300, and they'd probably have a winner on their hands. Yeah, I know. And I know people say that, you know, it can't, it, it's, a, it's a marketing gimmick. That card can't use 16 gigabyte of VRAM. That's just, that's wrong. That is fundamentally wrong. I mean, fire up Halo on, on the, the RX 7600 and then fire it up on the... 7600 XT, and you'll see that one on Ultra can load textures even at 1440p, and the other one can't. But there's, there's, it yeah. can use the memory. And the point is, it's it's an advantage to them. And again, it's just another Radeon blunder. Like, it's funny that they made a big deal out of the VRAM capacity stuff for RDNA 2. Like, mm-hmm. they made official press releases and they made official slides that they circulated to generate sales of those GPUs, saying they had more VRAM than their competition. And that was a real reason to buy AMD because they lasted longer and they blah, 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 blah. They, ma- they made all these points and they go to the next generation. They're like, yeah, so we'll offer uh, $300. Eight gigs is fine, right? <laughs> yeah, oh, you don't like that? Um, last minute, knock $30 off. That'll get us over the line. Like, it's almost like it's not planned. Yeah, there's it, yeah, there's a lot of things that, that don't really make too much sense. And, you know, it, it even goes back to things like the whole do games have FSR and DLS? Like, what, what's going on there? Mm-hmm. And it, it would have been much more beneficial for them to just explain the situation up front as soon as possible rather than letting that fester for several months until they eventually yeah, well, addressed don't, it. And don't bring, don't even I don't really want to bring that, that up, but, but it's again. like it's just another example of, you know, if they are making these moves, explain them. You know, what's well, going the only on reason, there, but, the only logical reason in their defense that they couldn't explain that was because what they were accused of was true. And well, the, and, and <laughs> sure, if you want to bring that up again. Oh, sure. I don't want to bring. Oh, I'm, no, in their defense, though, I'm just, yeah. which isn't really defense, but all I'm saying is, like, the, sometimes there can be explanations for things that can't be explained. That you don't moment. want to explain. Well, right? you don't want to explain, or there's more information behind the scenes that you don't know. But I'm saying that's probably a poor example of making the point we're making because. Uh, well, essentially, they incriminated themselves by not clearing their own name when they easily could have done so. But that's a huge can of worms that um, AMD mm-hmm. fans around the world um, are still uncomfortable <laughs> with. So let's move on. Well, that's right. I think I think as well with, with this discussion, there's obviously other areas that are much harder for AMD to compete with. Like, for mm-hmm. example, just creating a DLSS competitor is not like they can just put a few people on it, and then bam, it's done in like a week, right? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it takes a lot of work to get that feature out, and NVIDIA has been continually improving that feature over time as well, adding things mm-hmm. like you know, ray reconstruction and those those things over time. And so the software things I kind of understand that you know, while they are, it would be nice to see them release a, a feature that they're first to in the software front that makes you want a Radeon GPU and at the same time, they have to compete with all these NVIDIA features. It kind of makes sense that it takes them a while to get those features out. Mm. But what makes no sense are the basic things. Like, yeah. get figure out all the make frame your frame generation good and your upscaling good, work on all that in the background. But while that's taking time and while you're a little behind, you have to sort of concede that for a little bit. Ray tracing performance, another area, they kind of have to concede that their hardware isn't up to scratch for that just yet. While you're doing all that, just nail the basics. Get your marketing right. Make sure that all the products make sense. Make sure that you're not 
marketing one thing and then changing it later because you release a card that makes no sense with that marketing, like your 8GB GPUs, make your pricing right, get the basics right so you don't get bad reviews, you don't sully the brand, which is sort of what's been happening. And yeah, I think things would be a lot better. But as for you know, having their radio moment where they, well, their rise moment where they compete with NVIDIA, NVIDIA is not going to let them do that. So they're just going to have to continue fighting it out, really. Yeah, I mean, they're not going to let them do it, and they're also not trying nearly hard enough to make it happen. So. That's right. Okay, Steve, we've got some pricing and a lot of pricing numbers here. So hopefully oh, you'll you, you you keep track. Right. So, Steve, you suggested that the 7800 XT would be more competition for the 4070 Super if its price was closer to $450 than $500. Mm -hmm. If we assume the 4070 Super stays at $600 and the 7800 XT drops to $450, as you as wanted, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. $150, $150 yeah. difference. Yeah. So is the 7800 XT even in the same class of cards appealing to the same consumer, I guess, if that happens? Right. Would then the $725 7900 XT be a closer comparison? It's now more around $700. Or is that just the same issue as above given the spacing and price? So that card would be $100, $125 more expensive. So what would be the, the new comparison there? Yeah, there isn't really one. This is a very much a 5700 XT, so the original RDNA GPU. No one could agree on what the 5700 XT was designed to compete with because it was $400, 2060 Super came in at $400, and they were the same price. But the 5700 XT, while it had less features for rasterization performance, was generally quite a bit faster. And actually, in terms of rasterization performance, more closely competed with the $500 2070 Super. Mm -hmm. So there was no right or wrong comparison to be made there. If, if I compared it with the, the 2060 Super, you'd get comments saying, oh, but it's, it's a better competitor for the 2070 Super because of the price. That's what it should be compared with. And then if you compare it with the 2070 Super and it loses by a tiny percentage, people would argue that that's an unfair comparison because it's $100 cheaper, even though we noted mm -hmm. prices and performance in all these comparisons. So it's the same situation. You, you can compare it with either GPU. In one instance, one GPU, the Radeon GPU, the 7900 XT, ends up being $100 more, um, but is a lot faster for rasterization at least. Or one can be $150 cheaper and deliver similar performance. So you can, you can go either way with those comparisons, and that makes it, tricky for which one you end up buying mm -hmm. uh, but yeah there's there's two components obviously price performance mm -hmm. and if they link if they match up on one it's a valid comparison but you have to account for the other so, yeah that's right i think it depends a lot on the tier of pricing as well like mm -hmm. i think we would commonly say things like if you're spending around a thousand dollars then you know whether it's nine hundred a thousand dollars eleven hundred dollars it doesn't make a huge difference but mm -hmm. if you transport those $100 differences to more this class, then you know it's quite fair that someone who has around $500 to spend is probably going to consider a $450 GPU, but may not have the budget for a $600 GPU, and it may not make sense to save up that extra $100 because it just... Yeah, the price it's tiers matter. It's a different class of, of products. So I sort of agree with what this question is sort of saying, but at the same time, as you say, you can make any sort of comparisons that, that you like there. Like it, it is valid to say if someone is considering a $600 GPU that maybe they would consider the $450 7800 XT because it offers a slightly yeah, look, different balance of things. So If it's just throwing a number out there, 20% more affordable, but also 20% slower, then the comparison's kind of like... It's a different product. Why, yeah. yeah. It's, there's no need to make that comparison. It's like, well, yeah, it's 20% slower, it's 20% cheaper. I mean, it's a, it's a different product. But... Yeah, where it gets, again, the 5700 XT situation when it's similar performance but 20% cheaper, then it becomes complicated and you really have to dig in and, and try and compare them as best you can to really work out, at least for who, which option makes the most sense. Mm -hmm. All right, we're going to hit pause there on part one of the early February Q&A series. <laughs> we're, we're out of sync now. I'm all over the place. I don't know what's happening. But that was good. Um, obviously, after... Uh, extensive uh, i always want to say refresh of new products but mm -hmm. we did have like the 8700 g 8600g that sort of stuff which weren't necessarily refreshes but anyway after a lot of product releases following C ces uh, it's good to answer some questions some of them yep. relating to those products yeah it's always nice yeah it's good to good to get back and do this after i think our last one was like december of last year it feels like be, a long yeah. time ago so yeah good to get back 
and answer questions. We've got more questions to be answering. So stay tuned for part two, which will be on the channel shortly. So I guess what else is there to say, really? Not so, a lot, apart from the float plane Patreon stuff. Sign up right. to either one of those, get your more Harbour and Box goodness. You mm -hmm. can't get enough of that. So stuff like behind-the-scenes mm -hmm. content, Q&As, exclusive Discord server, and monthly live streams. So check it out. But other than that, I'm your host, Steve. I'm your host, Tim. Thanks for watching.